Sandra hadn't said a dozen words during the entire hour-long course of the meal, which left Sonny to chatter on, holding forth about his family, his plans in life, his ambitions, and anything else that came to mind as Mrs. Colombo served him multiple helpings of veal parmigiana. They were in the apartment of one of Mrs. Colombo's cousins, in the old neighborhood where they were staying for a few days while the landlord did some work on their Arthur Avenue apartment. The meal was served on a small round table, covered with white linen and situated next to a tall window that looked out over 11th Avenue and one of the rickety pedestrian bridges that crossed the railroad tracks. When he was a kid, Sonny loved to sit on that bridge with his feet dangling in the air as the steam engines passed beneath him. He considered telling Sandra the story of his first heartbreak when he sat on that very bridge with beautiful nine-year-old Diana Ciaffone and professed his love for her as the world disappeared in a cloud of steam and the clatter and roar of a passing train. He could still feel Diana's silence and see the way she had avoided his gaze while the train passed and before the world re-emerged as the steam dissipated. She had gotten up then without a word and walked away. He smiled as he remembered this at the dinner table, and Sandra said, What is it, Santino? Sonny, startled by the sound of Sandra's voice, pointed to the railroad bridge and said, I was just remembering how I liked to sit on that bridge when I was little and watch the trains. From the kitchen, Mrs. Colombo said, Eh, the trains. Always at the trains, and my God, to grant me peace from them. Sandra met Sonny's eyes and smiled at her grandmother's habitual grumbling. The smile seemed to excuse Mrs. Colombo, saying, It's just the way she is, my grandmother. Mrs. Colombo came in from the kitchen carrying a dish of sautéed potatoes, which she placed in front of Sonny. My Sandra made these, she said. Sonny pushed his chair back from the table and folded his hands over his belly. He had just consumed three servings of veal and a big side dish of linguine and marinara sauce, plus assorted vegetables, including a whole stuffed artichoke. Mrs. Colombo, he said, I don't say this very often, but I swear to you, I can't eat another bite. Manja, Mrs. Colombo said fiercely, and pushed the plate of potatoes closer to him as she dropped down into her seat. Sandra made these just for you. She was dressed all in black, as was usual for her, though her husband had died a dozen years ago. Sandra said to her grandmother, Non forzar. Sonny said, Nobody has to force me to eat. He dug into the potatoes and made a big deal about how delicious they were, while Sandra and her grandmother beamed at him as if nothing in the world could give them more pleasure than watching him eat. When he finished off the serving, he raised his hands and said, Non più, grazie, and laughed. If I eat another bite, he added, I'm going to explode. Okay, Mrs. Colombo said, and she pointed into the tiny living room off the kitchen, where the only furnishings were a sofa against the wall, a coffee table, and a stuffed chair. An oil painting of Christ's face contorted with suffering hung over the sofa, next to another oil of the Virgin Mary with her upraised eyes full of a profound mixture of grief and hope. Go sit, she said. I'll bring the espresso. Sonny took Mrs. Colombo's hand as he stood up from the table. The meal was magnificent, he said, touching his fingers to his lips and opening his hand in a kiss. Grazie mille. Mrs. Colombo looked at Sonny suspiciously and repeated herself. Go sit, she said. I'll bring the espresso. In the living room, Sandra took a seat on the sofa. The navy blue dress she wore came down to just below her knees, and she ran her hand along the fabric, smoothing it over her legs. Sonny, in the middle of the room, watched Sandra, uncertain whether to take a seat beside her or to sit across from her on the stuffed chair. Sandra offered him a shy smile, but otherwise gave him no signal. He looked behind him into the kitchen, where Mrs. Colombo was out of sight at the stove. He calculated quickly that he might have a minute or two alone with Sandra and so sat down alongside her on the couch. When he did so, her smile blossomed. With that as encouragement, he took her hand in his and held it while he gazed at her. He kept his eyes on her eyes and away from her breasts, but he knew already that they were full and heavy under the straining buttons of her plain white blouse. He liked the darkness of her skin and her eyes and her hair which was so black it almost appeared blue in the last of the daylight coming through the living room window. He knew she was only sixteen, but everything about her was womanly. 
He thought about kissing her and wondered if she would let him. He squeezed her hand, and when she squeezed his in return, he glanced into the kitchen to be sure Mrs. Colombo was still out of sight, and then leaned across the space between them, kissed her on the cheek, and leaned back to get a good look at her and gauge a reaction. Sandra craned her neck and stood up a little so that she could better see into the kitchen. When she was apparently satisfied that her grandmother wouldn't interrupt them, she put one hand on the back of Sonny's neck and the other on the back of his head, pushing her fingers up into his hair, and she kissed him on the lips, a full, wet, delicious kiss. When her tongue touched his lips, his body reacted, every part of him tingling and rising. Sandra moved away from Sonny and straightened out her dress again. She stared blankly in front of her and then glanced once at Sonny before she went back to looking straight ahead. Sonny slid closer to her and put his arms around her, wanting another kiss like the last one. But she put her hands flat against his chest and held him off. And then Mrs. Colombo's voice came booming in from the kitchen. Hey, she shouted. Luca sat at the dinner table across from his mother and held his head in his hands. A moment earlier, he had been eating and thinking his own thoughts and ignoring her as she went on and on about one thing or another. But then she started getting into her suicide spiel and he felt one of his headaches coming on. Sometimes he got headaches so bad he was himself tempted to put a bullet in his brain just to make the throbbing stop. Don't think I won't do it, his mother said, and Luca massaged his temples. He had aspirin in the bathroom medicine cabinet here and stronger stuff in his apartment on third. Don't think I won't, his mother repeated. I've got it all planned out. You don't know what it's like, or you wouldn't do this to your own mother, always having to worry one of the neighbors will knock on the door and tell my son's dead or he's going to jail. You don't know what it's like every day like that. She blotted tears from her eyes with the corner of a white paper napkin. I'd be better off dead. Ma, Lucas said. Will you lay off it, please? I can't lay off it, his mother said. She tossed her knife and fork down to the table and pushed her plate away. They were eating pasta and meatballs for supper. She'd made a mess of the meal because she'd heard rumors from a neighbor that some big-shot gangster was going to murder her son, and she kept imagining him like James Cagney in that movie where he's dragged through the streets and shot up and then they bring him home to his mother looking like a mummy in his bandages and leave him at the door for her to find. And she kept thinking of Luca like that, and so she overcooked the spaghetti and burned the sauce, and now the ruined meal sat in front of them like an omen of worse things to come. And she kept thinking she'd rather kill herself than live to see her son murdered like that or sent to jail. I can't lay off it, she repeated, and then she was sobbing. You don't know, she said. Luca said, What don't I know? It seemed to him that his mother had turned into an old woman. He could remember days when she wore nice clothes and put on makeup. She had been beautiful once. He'd seen the old pictures. She had bright eyes, and in one picture she wore a long pink dress and carried a matching parasol as she smiled at her husband, at Luca's father, who was a big guy too, like Luca, tall and powerfully built. She'd married young, still in her teens, and she'd had Luca before she turned 21. Now she was sixty, which was old, but not ancient, and that's how she looked to him now, ancient, all skin and bones, the outline of her skull shockingly visible under her papery, wrinkled face, her gray hair stringy and thinning with a bald spot on the top of her head. She wore drab, dark clothes, a crone dressed in rags. She was his mother, but still, he found it hard to look at her. What don't I know? he asked again. Luca, she said, pleading. Ma, he said, what is it? How many times have I told you I'm going to be fine? You don't have to worry. Luca, she said again. I blame myself, Luca. I blame myself. Ma, Luca said, don't start, please. Can we please eat our meal? He put his fork down and rubbed his temple. Please, he said. I've got a splitting headache. You don't know how I suffer, his mother said, and she wiped tears from her face with her napkin. 
I know you blame yourself for that night all these years, she said, because... Luca pushed his plate of spaghetti across the table into his mother's plate. When she jumped back, he grasped the table in his hands and he looked like he might pitch the whole thing over into her lap. Instead, he folded his hands in front of him. Are you starting on that again? He said. How many times do we have to go over this, Ma? How many goddamn times? We don't have to talk about it, Luca, she said. And then the tears were flowing down her cheeks. She sobbed and buried her head in her hands. For Christ's sake. Luca reached across the table to touch his mother's arm. My father was a drunk and a loudmouth, and now he's burning in hell. He opened his hands as if to say, what's to talk about? Through her sobs, without looking up from her hands, his mother said again, we don't have to talk about it. Listen, Ma, Luca said, it's ancient history. I haven't thought about Rhode Island in ages. I can't even remember where we lived. All I remember is it was up high, like nine, ten floors up, and we used to have to walk because the elevator never worked. On Warren Street, his mother said. On the tenth floor, Luca got up from the table and started for the bathroom. His head was pounding, and he knew it was one of those headaches that would last all night unless he took something. Aspirin weren't likely to help much, but even a little was worth trying. Before he made it to the bathroom, though, he stopped and went back to his mother, where she was sobbing again with her head in her arms, her plate of pasta pushed aside. He touched her shoulders as if he were about to massage her. Do you remember our neighbor? He asked. The guy who lived across the hall from us? Under his hands, he felt his mother's body stiffen. Mr. Lowry, she said. He was a high school teacher. That's right. Lucas said. How'd he die? He waited a moment and then said, All oh, right, he fell off the roof. That's right, isn't it, Ma? That's right, his mother whispered. I hardly knew him. Lucas smoothed his mother's hair again and then left her and went to the bathroom, where he found a bottle of squibs in the medicine cabinet. He shook out three aspirin, popped them in his mouth, and then closed the medicine cabinet door and looked at himself in the mirror. He'd never liked his looks, the way his brow protruded over deep-set eyes. He looked like a fucking ape man. His mother was wrong about it being an accident. He had intended to kill his father. The two-by-four was out in the hallway because he'd left it there. He'd already made the decision to beat his father's skull in the next time the old man punched his mother or knocked Luca across the room or kicked him in the balls, which was something he liked to do and then laugh about while Luca moaned and whimpered. He did these things, though, only when he was drunk. When he wasn't drunk, he was nice to Luca and Luca's mom. He'd take them down to the docks and show them where he worked. Once he took them both out on the water in somebody's sailboat. He'd put his arm around Luca's shoulder and call him his big boy. Luca almost wished the good stuff had never happened, because the old man was drunk a whole lot, and nobody could put up with him like that. And if there wasn't that other side of him, then maybe Luca wouldn't have dreams where his father was always coming back. It made him tired, the dreams and little flashes of memory that were always popping up. His mother naked from the waist down and her blouse torn open, exposing the shiny white skin of her belly swollen taut and round as she crawled away from his father on the floor bleeding where he'd already stabbed her, the old man crawling after her with the carving knife, screaming he'd cut it out of her and feed it to the dogs. All that blood and her round white belly swollen and then the old man's bloody head when Luca laid him out with the two-by-four. His father was out cold with the first blow to the back of the head, and then Luca stood over him and wailed on him until there was nothing in the air but blood and screams, and then the police and days in the hospital, and a funeral for the infant brother who'd never made it out of the womb alive. The funeral, while Luca was still in the hospital before he could come home. He'd never gone back to school after that. He'd only made it as far as fifth grade, and then he was working in the factories and on the docks before they moved to New York, where he worked in the rail yards, and that was something else he didn't like about himself. 
He was ugly and stupid. Only he wasn't so stupid. He watched himself in the mirror. He watched his own dark eyes. Look at you now, he thought. And he meant that he had more money than he knew how to spend, and he ran a small, tight gang that everybody in the city feared, even the biggest of the hotshots, Giuseppe Mariposa. Even Mariposa was scared of him, of Luca Brazzi. So he wasn't so stupid. He closed his eyes and the throbbing in the back of his head filled up the darkness. And in that throbbing darkness, he remembered the rooftop on Rhode Island where he had lured their neighbor, Mr. Lowry, the teacher. Luke had told him he had a secret to share, and once they were up on the roof, he'd pushed him over. He remembered him falling, the way his arms reached out on the way down as if someone might yet take his hand and save him. He remembered him landing on the roof of a car, and the way the roof caved in and the window glass shattered like an explosion. In the bathroom, Luca ran some water into his cupped hands and washed his face. It felt cool, and he smoothed his hair with his wet hands and then went back out into the kitchen where his mother had already cleared the table and was standing in front of the sink with her back to him, washing the dishes. Listen, Ma, Luca said. He massaged her shoulders gently. Outside, the evening was fading into night. He flipped on the kitchen lights. Listen, Ma he said again. I gotta go. His mother nodded without looking up from her work. Luca approached her again and smoothed her hair. Don't worry about me, Ma, he said. I could take care of myself, can't I? Sure, his mother said, her voice barely audible over the running water. Sure you can, Luca. That's right, Luca said. He kissed her on top of the head and then found his jacket and hat on the hall tree next to the door. He slipped in. He touched the butt of his pistol where it stuck out a little from an inside pocket just to reassure himself that it was there. He was going to kill Tom Hagen and that would rile up the Corleones. No way around it. That was big trouble on the way. Vito Corleone's reputation was more talker than killer. But Clemenza and his boys were tough guys especially Clemenza. Luca tried to size up what he knew of the Corleones. Genco Abandando was consigliere. He was Vito's partner in the olive oil business. Peter Clemenza was Vito's capo. Jimmy Mancini and Richie Gatto were Clemenza's men. That was all he knew for sure, but it wasn't a big-time organization, nothing like Mariposa or even Tatalia and the other families. It seemed to Luca that the Corleones were some place between a gang and an organization like Mariposa's and Tatalia's and Lacanti's, or what was left of Lacanti's. He knew Clemenza had more men than just Mancini and Gatto, but he didn't know who. Luca thought maybe Al Hatz was with the Corleones too, but he didn't know for sure. He'd have to find all this out before he took care of the kid. He didn't give a fuck if the Corleones had an army behind them, but he liked to know what he was up against. Luca considered that his boys weren't going to like this, and then, as if the thought made them appear, Jojo's yellow DeSoto pulled to the curb beside him, and Hooks stuck his head out the window. Hey, boss, Hooks said. He got out of the car wearing a black pork pie hat with a green feather in the hat band. What's this about? Luca watched as Jojo and the rest of the boys got out of the car and slammed the doors. They made a circle around him. We got trouble, Hook said. Tommy Cinquamani wants a meeting. He just showed up at the warehouse with a few of his men. He wasn't happy. He wants a meeting with me, Luca said. His head was still pounding, but the news of Cinquamani coming up to the Bronx to arrange a meeting made him smile. Who do you have with him? He asked. And he started walking again, heading for his apartment. Jojo looked back to his car parked on the curb. Leave it, Luca said. He'll come back for it later. Jojo said, We got guns stashed under the seats. And somebody's gonna steal from you in this neighborhood? Okay, Jojo said. Yeah. And he joined the others as they headed for Luca's. So who was with Cinquamani? Luca asked again. The bunch of them took up the sidewalk. 
The boys were in suits and ties as they walked on either side of Luca. Nicky Crea, Jimmy Grizio, and Vic Piazza, Polly said. Grizz, Luca said. He was the only one of the three that he knew, and he didn't like him. What did Tommy have to say? He wants a meeting, Hook said. Did he say about what? Vinny Vaccarelli stuck his hand down his pants to scratch himself. He was a wiry kid in his twenties, the youngest of the gang. His clothes always seemed about to fall off. He's got some things he wants to talk to you about. So the dentist wants to see me, Luca said. The dentist? Vinny asked. Luca said, stop scratching your balls, will you, kid? Vinny yanked his hand out of his pants. That's what they call Cinquemani, the dentist. Maybe he wants to work on my teeth. When the boys were silent, Luca explained. He likes to break guys' teeth off with pliers. Fuck that, Hook said, meaning he wanted no part of a guy who breaks people's teeth. Luca smiled at Hook's. All his boys looked a little nervous. Bunch of finooks, he said to them and walked on as if he were both disappointed and amused. So what do you want to do? Hooks asked. They were on 3rd Avenue alongside the L, a few doors down from Luca's place. Luca climbed the three short steps up to the door of his building and unlocked it while the boys waited. He pushed the door open and turned to face Hooks. Let Chinkumani wait, he said. Don't tell him anything. We'll make him come back and ask again. Nicer. Ah, for Christ's sake, Hook said, and he stepped into the hallway, edging in front of Luca. We can't play around with these guys, boss. Mariposa sent one of his capos to see us. We ignore him. Next thing we know, we're all going to be in boxes. Luca moved into the hallway with Hooks and the- Give me your heater, Willie said. What do you want my gun for? Donnie had just started down the ladder of the roof and he was looking up at Willie. When they'd seen Luca had all his boys with him, they'd abandoned their plan for another time. The roof across the alley was empty of people and crowded with crates. There wasn't much light left in the sky and the rooftops were all shadows. Never mind, Willie said. Just give it to me. You got your own gun, Donnie said. He lifted himself up to get a look back at the closed roof door. Ain't no one coming after us, he said. They don't know nothing. Just give me a fucking heater, Willie said. Donnie reached into his shoulder holster and handed Willie his gun. I still don't know what the hell you need my gun for. Willie gestured down to the next rooftop. Go on, he said. I'm right behind you. Donnie laughed and said, Are you going daffy on me? Luca thought it was one of the neighborhood kids. Kids were always climbing the rooftops. He thought maybe some kid being chased when the door banged open and someone came running down the steps. And then, to confuse matters even more, a train roared by on the L. Luca backed into the shadows and pulled his gun. Then lead started flying. One guy, two guns, blasting away out of the dark. All Luca saw was a shadow unloading fire. All he heard was the squeal and thunder of the passing train, punctuated by gunfire. When it was over, when the shadow flew away as quick as a ghost, he was pulling the trigger on an empty chamber, so he knew he had fired back and kept firing, but he'd be damned if he could remember anything past that first shot, and the window shattering and then crouching over Polly, who'd been hit and was moaning and then waiting for whatever might happen next, and the shadows and the stink of gunpowder, and the quiet after the train was gone and the shooting over. It was the surprise of the thing that had stopped him dead, and when he shook that off and he realized what had just happened, some torpedo opening up on them with two guns like a fucking cowboy, he bolted up the stairs after him. On the roof, he found nothing. There were two fire escape ladders, one on each side of the building. He made a note to have them removed. On the rooftop across the alley, a half dozen workers in overalls were hanging around the ledge and looking over. Behind them, the roof was loaded with crates. Luca yelled across, You birds see anything? When no one answered, he shouted, Well, didn't see a thing, someone with an Irish brogue said. 
Just heard the shooting. I wasn't shooting, Lucas said. It was kids with fireworks left over from the fourth. Ah, the voice said. So it was. He retreated with the others. When Luca turned around, he found Hooks and Jojo standing one on each side of the roof door like guards, pistols dangling from their hands. Put the guns away, he said. Hooks said, Paulie and Tony are shot up. How bad? Luca passed between them and went down the stairs. The staircase was dark and he had to hold onto the handrail and feel for the steps. Jojo said, They'll live. Hooks said to Jojo, What are you, a fucking doctor now? To Luca, he said, Looks like Tony took a bullet in the leg. Where in the leg? Couple of inches to the left and the kid will be a eunuch. Paulie? Right through his hand, Jojo said. Looks like Jesus Christ on the cross. On Luca's landing, where the wind blew into the hallway through the shattered windows, Hook said, Luca, we can't fool around with Cinquemani and Mariposa. They'll put us all in the ground. Jojo said, Hooks is right, Luca. This is crazy. For what? A few shipments of hooch? Luca said, You scared, boys? You scared of a little action? Hook said, You know better than that, boss. In the doorway to Luca's apartment, Tony was cursing and groaning, pressing the heel of his hand into his leg, trying to stop the bleeding. Luca knocked out a few shards of glass from the tattered remains of the hall window. It was dark, the only light coming from the open door to his apartment and up from the street. He figured if the coppers were coming, he'd have heard the sirens by now. He leaned out the window and looked down at the L. The street was empty, no one to be seen anywhere not a kid running or an old lady sweeping her stoop. Behind Luca, Vinny wrapped a bandana around Tony's leg. He's bleeding like a pig, he said. Can't get it to stop. Take him and Polly to the hospital, Luca said. Make up some story. Tell him it happened out on the docks. The hospital, Hooks asked. You don't think Doc Gallagher will take care of them for us? Lucas said, you worry too much, Hooks. He nodded to Vinny. Vinny went back into the apartment to get Paulie. On his way through the door, he said to Hooks and Jojo, I'll need you to give me a hand carrying Tony out. Hooks took his hat off and toyed with the feathers. To Luca, he said, so what now? What about Cinquemani? Luca knocked shards of glass out of the window frame with the butt of his gun. He looked up to the sky and a few stars that were faint points of light in the dark. A couple of small dark birds flew toward the window ledge and then veered away. Let's set up a meeting with Cinquemani, he said. He sat in the window frame. Outside Eileen's bakery, Sonny pulled to the curb, cut the engine, and slumped down in the driver's seat. He tilted his hat over his eyes as if he were about to take a short nap. The neighborhood was noisy with the rumble of trains coming from the rail yards and a line of cars and carts clattering along the street. He'd just left Sandra's and he'd walked along Arthur Avenue a while, feeling pent up and at loose ends, which wasn't unusual for him. And then he'd gotten in his car without really telling himself that he was going to Eileen's. He still thought he probably should just go back to his place and call it a night, but he didn't like spending an evening alone in Mott Street. He didn't know what to do with himself there. If his icebox had food in it, he'd eat it. But he didn't like shopping. He felt like a fanook buying groceries. Usually he'd go home to eat and his mother would give him something to bring back with him. And that's how food wound up in the icebox. Leftover lasagna or manigot and big jars of sauce. He never went home without coming back with enough food to last him a few days before he went home again, and so on. At his apartment, he'd lie on his back in bed and look at the ceiling. And if he didn't fall asleep, he'd get up and go looking for one of his boys, or try to find a card game somewhere, or hit a speakeasy. And then he'd drag his ass into work the next morning, half dead. Sandra had gotten him riled up. In his mind, he unbuttoned her blouse and peeled away her clothes till he got to those breasts, which would be delicious and ripe to be touched. But he might as well forget about it because it would take at least a bunch more dinners and maybe even an engagement ring before he got anywhere near those naked breasts. 
and he wasn't ready for that. But he liked her. She was sweet and beautiful. She had him going. Sonny tilted his hat back, leaned over the steering wheel, and looked up to Eileen's apartment. The lights were on in the living room windows. He didn't know how she'd react if he showed up like this without calling in the evening. He checked his wristwatch. It was almost nine o'clock, so Caitlin was likely in bed. When the thought occurred to Sonny that maybe Eileen's evenings alone in her apartment were as boring as his, that maybe all there was for her to do was listen to the radio before going to sleep, he got out of the car and rang the bell to her apartment and then stepped back on the street. Eileen opened a window and stuck her head out, and he opened his arms and said, I thought you might like some company. She was wearing a blue dress with a wide collar and her hair was marcelled. You had your hair done, he said and she smiled a smile he couldn't quite read. It didn't say she was happy to see him, but it didn't say she was unhappy either. She closed the window and disappeared without a word. Sonny took a step closer to the door and listened for the sound of her apartment door opening or her footsteps on the stairs. When he didn't hear anything, he took off his fedora and scratched his head. He stepped back to look up to her window again, and then the door flew open and Cork was out on the street. Hey, Sonny, Cork said, holding the door open. What are you doing here? Eileen said you're looking for me. Sonny said, what the hell happened to you? He said it a little too loud and too blustery in an effort to hide his surprise at seeing Cork, though Cork didn't seem to notice. Cork's shirt was smeared with bright red handprints over his heart. Caitlin, he said, frowning at the stains. Shirt's ruined. Sonny swiped a fingertip over the red stains and it came away clean. Some kind of kid's paint, Cork said, still looking at the handprints. Eileen says the shirt's a goner. That kid's a holy terror. She ain't so bad, Cork said. So what's going on? I went by your place, Sonny lied. You weren't there. That's because I'm here, Cork said, and he looked at Sonny cockeyed as if to ask if he had suddenly turned into an idiot. Sonny coughed into his fist while he tried to come up with something to say. Then he thought of the plan for their next job. Got word of another shipment, he said, lowering his voice. What, tonight? Ah, Sonny moved alongside Cork and leaned against the door frame. Don't know for sure when yet. I just wanted to tell you about it. What about it? Cork glanced back up the stairs and then motioned for Sonny to come into the hallway. It's cold, he said. It was like winter already. The shipment's small, Sonny said. He took a seat on the steps and pushed his hat up on his forehead. It's coming in a car rigged with an undercarriage. Plus, there'll be more bottles stuffed in the upholstery. Whose is it? Who do you think? Again, Mariposa? What do we do with it? We can't sell it to Luca. Best part, Sonny said. Juke's buying it from us direct. No middleman. And if Mariposa finds out Juke's selling his hooch, how's he finding out? Sonny said. Juke sure as hell's not telling him, and Mariposa's not in Harlem. Cork sat down next to Sonny and stretched out on the steps as if they were a bed. How much money would we make with a small shipment like that? That's the beauty, Sonny said. It's high-class champagne and wine direct from Europe. Classy stuff. Fifty, a hundred simoleons a bottle. How many bottles? In the kitchen, Sonny found her looking relaxed with a cup of coffee and a plate of brownies on the table in front of her. Sit down, she said, and she pushed an empty coffee cup across the table. Her hair seemed brighter with the new hairdo. The waves glittered under the kitchen light with every movement of her head. Cork came into the room with Caitlin on his shoulders. Say hello to Sonny, he said. He plopped himself down at the table, lifted Caitlin off his shoulders, and dropped her into his lap. Hello, Mr. Sonny, Caitlin said. Hi, Caitlin. Sonny glanced back and forth between Caitlin and Eileen and said, Wow, you're almost as pretty as your mama. Eileen looked at Sonny askance, but Cork only laughed and said, Don't be giving her a fat head. He put Caitlin down, patted her on the butt and said, Go play by yourself for a minute. Uncle Booby, she said, pleading and quit it with the Uncle Booby before I give you a shellacking. You promise? Caitlin said. 
What? Cork said. That'll give you a shellacking. That you come play with me in a minute. Promise, Cork said, and he waved her off into the parlor. Caitlin hesitated and glanced quickly over to Sonny before skipping off into the living room. She had her uncle's fine blonde hair and her mother's hazel eyes. Sonny said, Uncle Booby, and laughed. Isn't that perfect, Eileen said, out of the mouths of babes. Don't be encouraging her now, Cork said to his sister. She only says it to get a rise out of me. Eileen toyed with her coffee cup as if thinking about something and then said to Sonny, So have you heard that one Mr. Luigi Hooks Battaglia is still hunting down Jimmy's killer? Sonny turned to Cork. Ah, Cork said. Last time I ran into Hooks, he asked me to tell Eileen that he hadn't forgotten about Jimmy. Almost two full years now, Eileen said to Sonny. Two years and he's still out there, beating the bushes for Jimmy's killer. We got a regular gumshoe in Mr. Hook's battalion, don't we now? Cork said, according to Hooks, it was one of Mariposa's goons that killed him. Don't I know that? Eileen said. Doesn't everybody know that? The question is, which one of Mariposa's goons, and what is anybody ever going to do about it now that all this time has passed? Cork said, what's time got to do with it? If Hooks finds him, he's going to kill him. What's time got to do with it? Eileen repeated. Sonny said, Hooks is Sicilian, Eileen. Two and a half years is nothing. If Hooks finds out twenty-two and a half years from now who killed his friend, take my word for it, that man's dead. Sicilians don't forget and they don't forgive. Sicilians and Donegal Irish, Eileen said. I want the law to prosecute Jimmy's murderer, she said to Cork. You knew Jimmy. You know how he'd want it. God knows I loved him like a brother, Cork said, and he seemed suddenly angry. But we never agreed on these kinds of things, Eileen. You know that. He slid his chair back and looked into the living room, checking on Caitlin. Jimmy was an idealist, he said, turning to Eileen again. And me, you know, I'm a realist about such things. You'd approve of murdering the murderer, would you? Eileen leaned over the table toward her brother. You think that would prove something? You think that would change something? Well, I guess sound just like Jimmy now, he said and got up from his seat. It's breaking my heart. Hey, he called out to Caitlin in the living room. What are you doing over there? To Eileen, he said. If I knew who killed Jimmy, I'd kill him myself and be done with it. He looked to the living room again, raised his hands over his head, roared like a monster, and went chasing after Caitlin who screamed from someplace out of sight. Eileen looked across the table to Sonny. Jesus, she said, the two of you. Sonny said, sounds like a family argument. He glanced behind him to his hat where he'd hung it on the back of the door. I should be going. Bobby and Jimmy, she said as if Sonny hadn't said a word. They'd argue right here at this table. The two of them in always the same argument, different particulars. Bobby saying the world's corrupt and you have to live with it as it is, and Jimmy saying you have to believe in something better. Around and around. She looked down at her coffee and then up at Sonny. She didn't appear unhappy. That was Jimmy, she said. He didn't disagree with Cork. The world's full of dirt and aid. Sean pinched a flake of peeling yellow paint from the wall and waited for the clatter of a steam engine rumbling along its tracks on 11th to pass before he knocked again on Kelly's door. He'd just spent the last few hours riding the streetcars because he didn't want to go home to face Willie and Donnie. He couldn't stay out all night, though, and they told him to go, didn't they? Still, he didn't want to see them yet. Kelly! He shouted to the closed door. I know you're in there. I saw you walking past your window from the street. He pressed his ear to the door and heard a mattress squeak and then the clink of glass on glass. He imagined Luca Brasi's body slumped against the door to his apartment, and he wondered if Donnie really would cut off the bastard's dick and shove it in its mouth. He pictured it, Luca Brasi with his own dick in his mouth, and the image made him wince. 
He ran his hands through his hair and touched the gun in his pocket when Willie's words came back to him. Every Dago bastard in the city looking to shoot our Mick asses. Kelly, he said pleading. Come on now, it's your own brother out here. When the door finally opened, he took a step back and put his hands over his face. For God's sake, he said into the darkness. Well, Kelly said, you wanted to see me, Sean. Here I am. She held the half-open door in one hand and the door frame in the other. Both her eyes were blackened, her cheeks were swollen, and a red gash on her forehead disappeared into her hair. She wore a pair of bright red shoes and a man's white shirt with the sleeves folded up. From the size of the shirt, it had to be Luca's. The shirt tails reached her calves. Oh, for Christ's sake, Sean, stop being a baby, will ya? It's not so terrible. Sean took his hands away from his face and winced as he looked at her. Oh, mother of mercy, he said. Kelly. Kelly sneered at him and then grimaced as if the sneer had caused her some pain. What do you want, Sean? I thought the family was all done with me. You know I was never a part of all that, Sean said. He peeked behind her into the apartment. Can I come in? Kelly looked into her apartment as if it might have suddenly transformed into a place someone would want to enter. Sure, she said. Welcome to my palace. Inside, Sean searched for a place to sit. She didn't have a kitchen table and chairs, only an empty space in front of an empty sink. She didn't have a kitchen, really. There was a space with a sink and a few cupboards and then a hint of an archway that separated the kitchen space from the bedroom space, which was occupied by a small bed, a rickety nightstand beside the bed, and a big stuffed chair alongside a window that looked out onto 11th. Magazines and clothes were piled on the chair up to the armrests. Sean kicked at some of the clothes and magazines and clutter on the floor where the faces of Hollywood stars stared up at him. Gene Harlow, Carol Lombard, Fay Ray. He turned to find Kelly leaning against the closed door, watching him. Her shirt was opened halfway, and he could see more of her breasts than he was comfortable seeing. Button up, Kelly, will you? He gestured toward her breasts. Kelly pulled the shirt closed and fumbled with the buttons, but didn't make any progress. Oh, Kelly, Sean said. Are you too drunk to button your own damn shirt? I'm not drunk, Kelly said, her voice muted as if she were talking to herself as much as Sean. Nah, you just can't make your fingers work the buttons, he said, and he buttoned up the shirt for her, as if she were a little girl again and he was taking care of her. Look at you, Kelly, he said, and his eyes filled up with tears. Kelly said, when are you going to quit being a baby, Sean? She pushed him away and got back into bed. She pulled a red blanket to her waist and fixed a pillow under her neck. So now you're here. She leaned toward him as if to ask what he wanted. Sean cleared the clothes and clutter off the chair and pulled it alongside the bed. Kelly, he said, dropping down into his seat as if exhausted. Darling, he said, this is no kind of life you're living. Isn't it? Kelly said. Should I go back to cooking and cleaning for all of you? Doing everyone's bidding like a house servant? No thank you, Sean. Is that what you came here for? To bring me back home? I didn't come to bring you back home, Sean said. I came because I'm worried about you. Look at you. He slid his chair back as if to get a better view of her. You look like you should be in the hospital and you're lying here drinking yourself into a stupor. I'm not drunk, she said. On the night table beside her, a mostly full bottle of rye waited alongside an empty glass. Kelly, Sean said. When she didn't answer, he touched her neck and felt her steady pulse against his fingertips. Kelly, he said again, talking to no one. He took one of the pills from the plastic bottle, examined it, and then put it down. There was no label on the bottle. He pushed Kelly's hair back and saw that the gash went all the way up past her forehead almost to the top of her head. The cut was scabbed and ugly, but it didn't look deep. 
He pulled the blanket up to her chin, took her shoes off, and placed them side by side next to the bed. When he left the apartment, he checked to be sure the door was locked behind him. Out on the street, a harsh wind blew across the avenue off the Hudson. He clutched his jacket to his neck and hurried to his building, where he elbowed the door open and marched up the stairs and into the familiar rooms of his home. In the kitchen, his mother was sitting at the table with the comic pages of the New York American spread out in front of her. She'd always been a frail woman, but the years had turned her scrawny and her neck in particular was hard in the eyes, all skin and tendons and sunken flesh, like a chicken's neck. In her eyes, though, there was still a hint of the old brightness as she smiled at something in the comics. His father was out of sight somewhere, probably in bed with a bottle of whiskey next to him and a tumbler in his hand. Mom, Sean said, where are the boys? His mother glanced up from the paper. Crazy cat, she said, explaining the big grin in her face. The boys are up on the roof, she added, doing something with those fool birds. Are you all right then, Sean? she asked. You're looking a mite troubled. Nah, Sean said. Nothing's wrong, Mom. He held her by the shoulders and kissed her cheek. I've just been over to see Kelly. Ah, his mother said. And how is she? Still drinking too much. Sure, his mother said and went back to reading the comics, as if there was nothing more to be said on the subject. On the roof, Sean found Willie and Donnie sitting on a bale of straw next to the pigeon coop. The bottom of the coop, under a patched-together structure of wood and chicken wire, was thick with fresh straw. Donnie and Willie sat side by side, smoking and looking out over the rooftops. Wind riffled the collars of their jackets and mussed their hair. Sean took a seat on the roof ledge in front of them. Well, he said, did you do the job? Son of a bitch got lucky, Donnie said. He came back with his whole bloody gang. I put holes in a few of them, Willie said. What happened, Sean said. Did you shoot it out? Donnie nodded to Willie and said, Your brother's a bleeding lunatic. Willie, grinning, said, I lost my temper a wee bit. Donnie said, We were already on the roof on our way out of there and your lunatic of a brother tells me to give him my gun. So I give him my gun, and next thing I know, he's gone fucking cowboy on me. I was set on killing that son of a bitch, Willie said. Did you get him? Sean asked. Willie shook his head and took a long drag on his cigarette. I saw him come out on the roof after us. I was already on the next rooftop and onto the fire escape out of sight, but a guy that big's hard to miss. To Donnie, he said, I'm sure it was him. Too bad, Sean said. I hit at least two of them, Willie said. I heard them yowl and hit the ground. You think you killed them? I hope so. Willie put his cigarette out, grinding it into the tar paper roof with his shoe. I hate those bastard dagos, every one of them. So what now? Sean took his gun out of his jacket and put it down on the ledge beside him. Luke is coming after us? No, not yet anyway, Willie said. I was in the shadows and I had my cap pulled low. You still don't know what hit him. Not yet, Sean said.